Sunday before VBS, and uh, if you're watching from home, worshiping from home, or worshiping out in the courtyard, um, or if you're here with us um, together in person, um, we are all one body, and we are worshiping together today. You know, for the last eight months, um, and up until last week, my wife Cindy um, has been working as an operations manager for the third largest country, or third largest company in the world. Um, and as you can, might imagine, in a company that large and that successful, the managers work under a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, they spend a tremendous amount of each day scouring over the tiniest details of that day and coming up with a plan of how to improve things the next day. And whenever they're doing that, whenever someone says, well, let's just hope tomorrow's better, the well-known and well-rehearsed response is all, always we all know hope is not a strategy. It's actually a common saying in politics and in the business world. Hope is not a strategy. And I suppose if we were to define hope as wishful thinking that something will get better all on its own, then it's true. Hope is not a strategy. But if we lose hope, nothing else really seems to matter. We've been in a series through the Old Testament minor prophets called Course Corrections, and each week we've been looking at the primary message of one minor prophet and then listening for God's voice about any course corrections he might be leading us to make in our lives in light of that message. Last Sunday from the prophet Haggai, we saw how to persevere when we feel like giving up. And today from Zechariah, the 11th of the 12 minor prophets, we're going to see how to find hope when hope seems lost. Now, like Haggai, Zechariah was a prophet to God's people in the 6th century before Jesus was born. This was after God's people had returned from their exile in Babylon. And their return from exile was very anticlimactic because most of God's people actually decided exile wasn't so bad and they stayed in Babylon and Persia. And so it was only a handful who did return to their homeland. And when they returned, they found their city of Jerusalem in ruins. They found their temple destroyed. Their return from exile was a far cry from the triumphal return that they had prayed for and hoped for. So let's begin Zechariah, the very first verse, to get, kind of get our bearings. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Ido. Zechariah was a grandson of Ido, which was a prominent priestly family. And so it's likely that Zechariah himself was a priest. And we can date the beginning of Zechariah's ministry as a prophet here to November or December 520 B.C. That was the time when Darius, the Persian king, was king. And this overlaps with the ministry of the prophet Haggai. Now after a brief introduction that we'll look at in a couple of minutes, chapters 1 through 6 of Zechariah describe eight different visions Zechariah experienced. And this is followed in chapters 7 and 8 by four sermons, and that's followed by two oracles about the future in chapters 9 through 14. Basic overview of this minor prophet. The book of Zechariah is notoriously difficult to interpret and understand. In fact, there's a 5th century pastor named Jerome who said it was one of the most obscure books of the Old Testament. And a medieval um, Jewish rabbi named Rashi said that no one would be able to really understand the book of Zechariah until the Messiah came and personally explained it. It was that hard to understand. And there is a lot that's puzzling about this book. But what's not puzzling is the primary theme because the primary theme of the book of Zechariah is hope. And in Zechariah today, in our overview, we're going to see four course corrections we can make when we lose hope. So for the course, first course correction, let's look at verses 2 through 6 of the first chapter. And it says this, and we'll put it on the screen. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. 
Therefore, tell the people, God speaking to Zechariah, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets overtake your ancestors. Here God reminds the people of Zechariah's generation that he was angry with the previous generation, with their ancestors. That generation had broken faith with God. Instead of giving their whole lives to God as God had commanded, they had chased and devoted themselves to other gods, to idols. Instead of acting with compassionate justice in their community, in their society, they had neglected justice. And earlier prophets like Micah and Amos and Hosea had warned that generation again and again that them breaking their covenant promises with God would not go unanswered. And yet they persisted in breaking faith with God until finally God allowed the Babylonians to invade Jerusalem and carry them into exile. But I want you to notice something important in these verses. As God recounts the sins of their ancestors, God urges his people of Zechariah's generation to turn back to him. Why would God's people in Zechariah's generation need to turn back to God when it was their ancestors from the previous generation who had broken faith with God? Let's drill down on this a bit because it's important. The Bible teaches that people's sins impact future generations and that we are impacted by generations that came before us. Sometimes this is called ancestral sin or generational sin. And we find this teaching throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. For instance, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, God says that people's sins are visited on their children to the third and fourth generation. We find it in Jeremiah 32, verse 18, when the prophet describes the sins of parents as landing in the laps of their children. Now, this teaching does not mean that God condemns us for the sins of our ancestors. Every person will ultimately answer to God for their own decisions in life, for their own sins, not the sins of their ancestors. But what I think this teaching does mean is that the sins of our ancestors have an impact on us. And our sins have an impact on future generations. So what exactly is this impact? Well, I think it's this. Each of us has an inclination, a predisposition to repeat the same sins that our ancestors committed. If our ancestors were thieves... All have more of an inclination to be a thief than a person whose ancestors were not thieves. If our ancestors held to racist ideologies, then their descendants will be more prone to embrace racist ideas as well. And the kinds of sins that I commit, my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be more prone to. So if I cause divisions among people, my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids will be more predisposed to being divisive people. Now again, God does not condemn us for the sins of our ancestors, but those sins make us predisposed to repeat them. Now, this does not mean that ancestral sin is an unchangeable script that's already written in advance for our lives. That's not what it means. The fact that we have a predisposition to something doesn't mean that we have to do it. 
And that's why here in Zechariah, God urges his people not to be like their ancestors, to resist this inner predisposition to repeat the same sins that their ancestors had committed. Every person can be different. We can chart new paths. New generations can break the cycle of the sins of their ancestors. But we can't ignore the impact of the sins of our ancestors on us. And this is why in the Bible, often when God's people confess their own sins, they also confess, confess the sins of their ancestors. I'll give you two examples. Um, in Daniel's great prayer of confession, in Daniel chapter 9, you read the whole chapter on your own. In Daniel 9, 8, Daniel says, And we and our kings, our princes and our ancestors are covered in shame, Lord, because we sinned against you. Another example from the book of Nehemiah chapter 9, when all of God's people gather together to confess their sins, Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 2 says, all of God's people stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. You see, one of the reasons Zechariah's generation had lost hope is because they knew this. They knew that they carried the burden of the sins of their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. And they wondered, what hope is there for us? If we already have this predisposition to repeat the same patterns, they believed that they'd forever have to live under the stain of their ancestors' failures with a predisposition to repeat the same patterns that had been repeated for generations. And so God's invitation here, return to me and I will return to you, was a ray of hope. You see, when hope is lost, God invites us to return to Him. God invites us to return to Him. It is never too late to return to God. No matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, no matter what sins your ancestors committed or what sins you have committed, it is never too late to respond to God's invitation to turn to Him and He will turn to you in grace. Now let's skip ahead to chapter 3 for the next course correction. This is one of Zechariah's visions. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Then God showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. In this vision... The prophet Zechariah sees his high priest, Joshua, who we were introduced to last week in Haggai. And Joshua, the high priest, is standing in filthy, dirty, soiled clothing before the angel of the Lord. And this is, this is a vision of an ancient courtroom with Joshua standing as the accused, the angel of the Lord as the judge, and Satan standing as the prosecutor. Now, in the Old Testament... The high priest represented all of God's people of his generation. So in this vision, Satan is not merely accusing Joshua. He's accusing all of God's people of Joshua's generation. And the filthy, soiled clothing Joshua's wearing represents the guilt that Joshua and his generation carried, both because of the sins of their ancestors and because of their own sins. He stands guilty, and the people stand guilty. Now, Satan may be a liar, but he doesn't need to lie in order to find things to accuse us of. 
Notice that God does not dispute the truthfulness of Satan's accusations in this vision. Instead, the Lord rebukes Satan into silence. God describes Joshua the high priest and the people he represents as being like a burning stick that was snatched out of a fire pit just before it caught fire and burned up. They may be charred and smoldering, but they've been rescued, saved, and given another chance. The judge in this vision, this courtroom vision, the angel of the Lord issues a command for Joshua to be given a new clean set of clothing. And this new set of clean clothing represents cleansing, not just for Joshua, but for all of God's people that he represents. When hope seems lost, God provides us with cleansing from our sins. God provides us with cleansing from our sins. This vision is a beautiful picture of what it means to be forgiven by God. Because we are all clothed with soiled, dirty clothing, soiled by our own sins and the sins of our ancestors, going all the way back to our first ancestor, Adam. And each one of us stands before God as our judge, like a guilty criminal, accused by a prosecutor who has more than enough evidence to ensure our conviction. But amazingly, unexpectedly, instead of condemning us, this judge cleanses us. And the New Testament actually adds to the picture here that the clean change of clothing that we're given when we're forgiven by God is actually the righteousness of Jesus himself. Jesus Christ's perfect sinless life created a righteousness that's clean and unstained by human sin like a new set of clothes. And when we trust in Him, our soiled, dirty clothing of our guilt is stripped away and we are clothed in the new, clean clothing of Jesus Himself. The the 16th century reformer Martin Luther called this the wonderful exchange where we exchange the stain of our guilt For the cleanness of Christ's own righteousness. When hope seems lost, God provides us with cleansing. Now let's skip ahead to chapter 7 of Zechariah for the the next course correction. Verses 8 through 10. It says, And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Here, Zechariah is actually quoting God's message to their ancestors. And God reiterates this command to Zechariah's generation to live the kind of lives their ancestors had failed to live. Now, in this series, we learned from the prophets Amos and Micah that social injustice had become a huge issue for the people of God prior to the exile, that the Babylonian exile was at least in part a consequence for Israel's neglect of justice in their communities. And here the word of the Lord comes to Zechariah, calling this new generation to do what their ancestors had failed to do. There are two positive commands in verse 10 and two negative commands in verse 11. The two positive commands in verse 10 are to administer true justice and to show mercy and compassion. Administering true justice means making things right when someone has been harmed by another person, making it right. If injustice is like a poison that makes people sick, Justice is like a medicine that can help people get well. And I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but instead, I would encourage you to go back, if you didn't see it, to watch my May 23rd message from the book of Amos and my June 13th message from Micah about true justice. Showing compassion and mercy means keeping our covenant commitments to people. Means being people of integrity. Means treating people with value. 
being faithful to the promises and obligations we have with other people. The two negative commands in verse 10 are to refrain from oppressing the vulnerable and to refrain from plotting evil against each other. People with power and resources are always tempted to exploit people who don't have power and resources. And again, I'll refer you back to that message out of Amos about who the vulnerable were back then and who they are today. But I want us to think about this from these four commands of verses 9 and 10. When we, as God's people, do not obey these commands, we take away other people's hope. Injustice, withholding mercy and compassion, oppression, evil plots, these are the things that rob other people of their hope. But true justice... Showing mercy and compassion, stopping oppression, exposing evil plots. These are the things that give people hope. When hope seems lost, God calls us to compassionate justice. God calls us as his people, just like he called them to compassionate justice. I find it so interesting that God commands a group of people who had lost their hope to begin doing things that would offer hope to other people. But that's the way hope works, isn't it? When we're feeling hopeless, if we do something that brings a little hope to someone else, it sparks hope within us. Hope is contagious that way. God knows that Zechariah's generation already have an inclination to withhold justice to withhold mercy, to oppress the vulnerable, to plot evil. Because that's what their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents had done. Zachariah's generation carried the burden of their ancestors' sins, a burden they didn't ask for. But they can choose a different path. They can choose to become hope givers instead of hope stealers. But to do that, they'll need to heed God's call, compassionate justice. Finally, one more verse to look at, and it's my favorite verse from Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 12, says this, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. The people of Israel had already, always viewed the city of Jerusalem as their fortress. Jerusalem was the stronghold. It was on a hill. The people believed that it could never fall. It could never be invaded. It was a, a refuge for God's people. It was a place you could flee and find safety during times of war. It was their refuge until the Babylonians invaded. And it fell. Because Israel's fortress had never really been a physical city. Israel's true fortress had already always been their covenant relationship with their God. And by returning to their relationship with God, they would return to their true fortress. And there, they would become prisoners of hope. I just love that phrase. Prisoners of hope or people who are held captive to an expectation that God is working out his good plan no matter what it appears in the world around us. A prisoner of hope can't help but look to the future and know that God is going to have his way and his kingdom will come. A prisoner of hope cannot escape God's hope because hope is wrapped around their lives like a chain, holding them strong. You see, when hope seems lost, God holds on to us no matter what. He holds on to us no matter what. When we find refuge in the stronghold of our relationship with God, in the fortress of our covenant with God, we become prisoners of hope. 
and God holds on to us. So I I don't know whether hope is an effective business strategy or not. But I do know that if we lose it, we lose everything else as well. When we fear that we're losing hope, God invites us to turn once again to Him. God invites us and provides us with cleansing from sin, both our own sin and the sins of our ancestors that we have an inclination to repeat. God calls us to a life of compassionate justice. And He promises to hold on to us no matter what happens. And in our polarized, outraged, unstable, cable news saturated society today, I want to live as a prisoner of hope. I want to be the person who says, yes, things look bleak, but God is working out His good plan. I want to be the person who looks unflinchingly at the evil around us and who humbly admits in the ways that my own failures and the sins of my ancestors have contributed to that evil, but who says, I don't have to live that way. I want to be the kind of person who's been cleansed of my sin, given a new set of clothes, who lives with compassionate justice, who's a prisoner of hope. It's the kind of Christian I want to be in our time. I hope it's the kind you want to be as well. So I want to end today slightly differently. I want to end with a time of confession, just like the ones we see in Scripture. And so in a minute, we're going to have a time of silence, and I invite you to just ask God to search your heart. What do you need to confess? What sins um, do you carry? What, what are the sins of your ancestors that you need to confess to Him? And then I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession out loud, drawn from one of our Reformed prayer books. And I invite you, if you'd like, at home, out on the patio, here in this sanctuary, that if you'd like to pray this prayer with me, to pray it out loud with me this prayer of confession. So let's first go before God in silence. Search our hearts, God. Now pray this prayer together if you'd like. All together. Merciful God, we confess our own sins and the sins of our ancestors. We confess that both we and our ancestors have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I invite you to hear these words of assurance. To all who turn from sin and sorrow, to all who turn to God in hope. This is God's promise in grace. You are accepted. You are forgiven. You are loved. And this is a gift that we have from God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together, or let's stand together for a closing song.